Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is C.B. Mamarill. I'm with the National Accordion Center here at the University of Kentucky for PBR and PHSR, and we'd like to welcome everyone to the PHSR Research in Progress webinar series. And as we are about to get started, I, we would just uh, like to say how delighted we are to have our presenter today, who will be presenting her research in quantifying the value of public health intervention, Dr. Teresa Green, who is a director of the Community Health Policy and Education Center for Community Health at the University of Rochester Medical Center at URMC. Dr. Green has professional and academic experience in clinical care, business administration, policy development, and community health research. Her career interests lie in community-based systems research, education, and evaluation, including econo economic analysis. Dr. Green leads the community health improvement planning work also for the hospital systems in Monroe County, New York. She is also a Dean's Teaching Fellowship recipient at URMC for 2014 until 2016, and is currently teaching interdisciplinary population health concepts through community-engaged learning to medical students and residents. And after Dr. Green also gives her uh, presentation, we're also um, Delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Michael Soto and Dr. Byron Kennedy, who I'll introduce a little more late uh, later, uh, to give some commentary on Dr. Green's uh, research presentation. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you, Teresa, to start your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, as was stated, I'm presenting my dissertation work on quantifying value in public health. Uh, the work was supported by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation also through the pre and post doctorate uh, grant program. The intent of this work is to measure whether investing in public health provides value. I studied a public health infrastructure change, which was the establishment of the Center for Community Health within the University of Rochester Medical Center and measured over time if there was a return on investment in both economic terms and whether there was an increase in community health capacity. So what do we mean by value when we say an increase in value? The value of an intervention is the measure of benefit gained per dollar spent. Benefit depends on one's perspective and the beliefs and priorities of the person who is assessing the value. An intervention can provide good value and can provide substantial health benefit per dollar spent without necessarily saving money. This is a confusing point in the literature. Return on investment is a measure of financial gain, how much financial benefit will be returned for a given cost. This is strict, strictly a financial measure and health benefits are not considered with this calculation. All reasons why I chose to talk about value. There's very little research on cost effectiveness in the community or public health setting, especially for broad-based infrastructure investments. However, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation highlighted four stellar examples of public health research in this area in a March 2012 policy brief. In general, these articles showed that increases in funding for public health, community-based health improvements, and environmental change led to improved health outcomes and the associated decreases in costs, including excess costs associated with caring for people with preventable chronic disease. So why the slides are looking strange there? Okay. <laughs> More. Most cost studies in public health are either national in scope, as the studies just presented, or focus on a specific measurable intervention, for example, diabetes care. However, most public health practitioners are trying to make a business case for investing in public health and need local focus that's department-wide. Also, most cost studies in public health are predictive and require modeling techniques that might be beyond the scope of most public health practitioners. A simplified real-world example of a mid-level analysis was lacking in the literature, and I tried to provide that in my research. 
real-world understandable examples of quantifying the value added by supporting public health are now critically necessary. Money for public health spending, both locally and nationally, are not increasing. The government continues to fund the treatment of disease rather than its prevention, with only 3% of the 2.5 trillion healthcare dollars spent each year spent in public health. Funding decisions are under great scrutiny. In order to make <coughs> funding for public health delivery, practitioners and researchers will need to answer decision makers' questions about cost effectiveness and return on investment. Policymakers need to know that their funding decisions have a positive impact. Accountability has never been more demanding. The Affordable Care Act Prevention Fund has already been cut substantially, and some of the Affordable Care Act funded programs, such as the Community Transformation Grant, have already been closed. In addition, under the Affordable Care Act, nonprofit hospitals have even greater requirements for providing community benefits. Hospitals must demonstrate substantial contributions to improving community health in order to maintain their nonprofit status. Of course, this is no easy task. However, most public health practitioners and researchers are ill-equipped to answer return on investment questions. Clear definitions of what constitutes public health success is lacking. Therefore, assigning financial benefit to success is often impossible. There is also no standards for cost collection or financial investments, although a few tools are being developed. The CDC, along with AASHTO, has a tool for estimating return on investment for QI efforts being used with the National Public Health Improvement Initiative. And the Public Health Finance and Management offers the funds, Public Health Uniform National Data System, standardized financial investments. Public health investments, especially in infrastructure and policy change, take years to result in changes in health outcomes, and causation can almost never be attributed to the initial investment. In addition, public health interventions often involve human behavior change, which is unpredictable, difficult, and often take a long time with many failed attempts prior to success. One of the four sections of the PHSSR research agenda concentrates on public health financi financing and economics. My dissertation research contributes to at least two of these research questions on the PHSSR agenda, that being what measures provide the most valid and reliable indicators of financial performance, and how do investments in public health strategies influence the need for downstream spending on medical care and social services. A practical example of measuring value added from an investment is given here in the development and financing of the Center for Community Health. The center was developed in 2006 as an extension of an existing relationship between the University of Rochester and the Monroe County Department of Public Health. The Public Health Department sought evaluation and research expertise from the university, and the university was in need of a way to improve community engagement and to fulfill the URMC mission to improve community health. The university made an initial financial contribution to establish the center and annually afterwards to support the maintenance and growth of the center's infrastructure. My work examines the value that the UR sees for in its return for that investment. Specifically, my research question asked, does the University of Rochester's investment in the development and maintenance of the Center for Community Health provide a value benefit, either financially or in the health of the community? This question is answered by exploring and quantifying the results of the university's investment, including financial gains, process outcomes, and long-term impacts on the community's health. I conducted a mixed methods retrospective analysis of the value change associated with the development and growth of the center. Quantitative analysis of financial data was collected, as well as a qualitative interview assessment of programs and services. The 10 essential services were used as a measure of community health capacity, which is an unproven proxy for health outcomes. Then a case study of one of the programs offered at the center will be presented as an example of directly measuring health outcomes resulting from the URMC investment. This research demonstrates a replicable study design for other public health system practitioners and researchers. The research question in general will take on some form of is there value added. 
Several frameworks for assessing value are discussed in an integrated framework for assessing the value of community-based intervention, or excuse me, community-based prevention, developed by the Institute of Medicine in 2012. Um, in that inclu are included the pre-seed proceed model, the re-aim, and health impact assessments. Although each of these models has advantages, none by itself provided a comprehensive framework for public health system impact on value. I designed a unique framework building on the IOM models for general application in public health beyond specific health promotion interventions. The framework helps to define some parameters around value, to add context to the evaluation, such as who is interested in the value and what is of value to that person. Once the framework is established, measures of value can be collected, both quantitative and qualitatively, including financial measures and other value parameters. Then the story should be put together in a way that makes sense to the target audience. Briefly, the framework is laid out on this busy slide. Designed to be replicable and easy to follow, an eight-step framework for public health practitioners who are new to this gives context to any financial or economic analysis. It's important to think through what is the outcome of importance to the decision maker. And often this includes how best to analyze that outcome in financial terms. Defining the time frame and the decision makers helps in limiting the analysis to only outcomes of importance to the audience. The logic model indicated in step four should graphically represent how the outcomes ties to the decision maker. Once outcomes are clearly defined, assigning a monetary value to that outcome in step six is important for making the business case and often necessitates a literature review of similar studies and their financial assessment of similar outcomes. The story indicated in step eight helps frame the analysis in language familiar to the decision maker. A study uses this framework to add context to the financial analysis. So using the framework to answer questions one, two, and three, my study is retrospective and analyzed data from fiscal year 2006 through fiscal year 2012, the last complete fiscal year at the time of my analysis. The perspective of the analysis is that of the University of Rochester, who is the decision maker, interested in how the center is reaching the mission of improving community health, but also if the financial investment has been worthwhile. Step four suggests developing a logic model to tie system change and investments to the valued results. This is the logic model that I used. And if you follow from left to right, the university invests annually in the Center for Community Health. The money, along with other revenue streams, primarily extramural grant funding, covers the expenses of the center, primarily wage and fringe of staff, rent, subcontracts with community partners, and programmatic costs such as supplies and travel. Some extramural funding allows for indirect costs which go directly back to the university and are used for institutional expenses. The exchange of revenue and expenses in the financial benefits column supports the work of the center to improve community health through increased public health capacity as measured by the 10 essential public health services. Increased work in the 10 essential services should lead to improved health impacts although this has not been extensively examined in the literature. My quantitative analysis was of the financial records of the center and a qualitative assessment through interview of the CCH managers and directors evaluated contributions to the 10 essential services. A case study of the blood pressure advocacy program, one of the many centers programs, was analyzed for direct health impacts and outcomes and the resulting cost averted. Step six and seven of the framework suggest collecting data for each measure using appropriate economic methods for analyzing to calculate value. Financial information was collected from the finance director and the accountant of the center, and access was obtained to the university system for tracking extramural funding, which contains indirect cost information. The university support funding was per fiscal year, but extramural funding and indirect support often span several fiscal years but was calculated by proportion based on fiscal year. A report was generated by the finance department through the University Human Resources of all employees who have worked at the center. Department date and termination date were used to determine the number of employees each year and their full-time equivalents hired and exiting the center. After time series graphs were generated, several ratios were calculated. 
the ratio of total budget minus the university support over UR support was calculated as a return on investment for the university. The university support as a percent of the total budget was calculated over time, as was the ratio of indirect cost per university support. And at last, some results. The internal investment from university to the Center for Community Health has remained relatively constant over the years at around $850,000. However, extramural award funding has increased 360,937 in fiscal year 07 to 4,577,000 in fiscal year 12, resulting in total financial revenue for the center in 2012 of $5.5 million. This is a 516% return on investment. However, of course, this return is not given as funding returned to the university. It is instead used towards increasing community health capacity. In addition to the funding streams mentioned above, the center is also responsible for managing funds assigned to other centers and departments throughout the university. Most relevant, the 338,000 of the CTSI award in community engagement function is through our department, not included in these graphs. Here, the ratio of UR support as a percent of total funds annually is plotted over time. Since the UR support has remained relatively constant at around 850,000 annually, and total funds have increased substantially, the UR support as a proportion of total funds has decreased from 69.5% in 07 to 16% in fiscal year 12. I also examined the sources of extramural funding over the years. While state funding has remained relatively constant over the years, federal funding has increased substantially and now accounts for 53% of our extramural funding. Federal funding is from research grants supported by the NIH, and most recently a community tra transformation grant from the CDC for $3.2 million over five years. The CDC also supports the Emerging Infection Program at the center. Organizational funding has also increased, and this includes funding from local foundations and hospitals. City and county funding has increased, however, dropped in 2012 due to the transfer of the school-based influenza vaccine program from the center to the Monroe County Department of Health, Public Health. State funding supports primarily the cancer services program, but also contributes to the healthcare-acquired infection surveillance program. Extramural funding is particularly important to the University of Rochester because often when funding is awarded, indirect costs can be allocated and the indirect collected go directly to the university. Indirect funds grew substantially in the first five years. Indirect costs decreased in fiscal year 12. Again, Sorry, uh, Teresa, let me just interrupt you for a while. Uh, we'd just like to remind everyone, please, as a courtesy to our speaker, please mute your phones. Sorry about that, Teresa. Go ahead. Thank you. Indirect funds grew substantially in the first five fiscal years. Indirect costs decreased in fiscal year 12, again, due to the elimination of the school-based influenza vaccine program. The goal over time, of course, is for indirect costs to exceed the UR support funds. A major expense, but also the primary source of capacity growth, is the faculty and staff employed by the university working at the center. Although the operational funding from UR support for wage and fringe has remained relatively constant in the operating budget, the staff at the center has grown over the years through the extramural funding. The number of employees and number of full-time equivalents have followed a positive trajectory since the center opened in fiscal year 06 with the exception of fiscal year 11, showing a decrease in both employees and full-time equivalents. Starting with 13 employees in fiscal year six, the center now supports 63 employees doing work in community health. So in summary, the financial contributions from the university has been consistent from 12 to seven to 12, and has yielded a 516% return on investment, which has been used to grow community health capacity through increased extramural programs and services and increased staff. Some of the services provided at the center are listed here. 
The center does work at all levels of the socioecological model, and all work is focused on prevention. You will recognize some programs that are often performed at governmental health departments, such as cancer services and communicable disease surveillance and prevention. While some programs are unique and grant funded, such as the Community Transformation Grant, we also do public health research on behavior change and community benefits planning, as well as health education with the medical school. To assess the community health capacity of the center, volunteer interviews were conducted with each of the 14 service area directors or program managers. The managers and directors were asked to describe their program areas so that a concise description of each could be included in this dissertation and not left out of this presentation, obviously. Then, after a discussion of the 10 essential public health services, managers and directors were asked to list where their services coincided with public health essential services, if any. Lastly, interviews were at, interviewees were asked if they felt their services or programs added financial value to the university. Answers to all the questions were recorded manually and confirmed when the interviews were done. According to the information provided in the interviews, the Center for Community Health contributed substantially to the 10 essential public health services. The 10 essential services are listed here and on the next slide with a number of unique contributions as reported from the managers. The right column gives an example of a contribution that was cataloged. The services most often mentioned by managers and directors is essential service number four, mobilizing community partnerships and action to identify and solve health problems, which had 17 unique contributions, followed by number three, inform, educate, and empower, which had 13 unique contributions. Managers and directors felt they contributed less frequently to essential services number two, diagnose and investigate health problems, and number one, monitoring health status to identify and solve community health problems. However, this is a bit of an understatement since although few managers contribute, their contributions are quite substantial. For example, the center shares responsibility with the health department for the county behavior risk factor survey and directs all infectious disease surveillance for the region. Essential service number seven, linking people to needed personal health services, was also well represented with 13 contributions. And one example of this service is the Cancer Services Program. Managers and directors did not feel as though they contributed to essential service number six, enforced laws and regulations, that had zero contributions, but which is to be expected since the center, as an academic medical center, does not have regulatory authority. Qualitative assessment shows that the center contributes substantially to the 10 essential public health services, which should help to improve community health in Rochester, which was the intent of the university when supporting the Center for Community Health. There is not a clear-cut measure of improved community health, and even if there was, it would not be possible to equate improvements to the support of the Center for Community Health. It is possible, although beyond the scope of this project, to quantify health improvements across the 14 or so programs and services, and then to calculate economic value for each one. I picked one as a case study to evaluate. The Blood Pressure Advocacy Program, or BPAP, is what I picked and demonstrate how this could be accomplished. The BPAP program uses community health workers at health clinics to meet one-on-one -on -one with patients who have out of control diagnosed high blood pressure to help them with lifestyle and medical medication changes to decrease their blood pressure. And if you follow this schematic from right to left, the university invests annually in the growth of the center, which has turned the $850,000 investment into a $5.5 million budget for community health work, including returning $488,000 to the university in indirect funds. Because the center's infrastructure, we were able to apply for and win a $300,000 subcontract to train 13 community health workers and develop and implement the BPAP program in four clinics across Rochester. Again, this is just one of the many programs at the center. The BPAP program has intervened with over 3,000 patients, 232 of whom are in the BPAP program currently. Those 232 in the 10 months of the intervention were able to decrease their blood pressure from 150 over 85 to 132 over 78, which reduces the risk of stroke and MI averted, averting excess medical costs of 
So when you're talking about value, you can add that 545,000 to the benefit added. The, <clears throat> the 545,000 cost averted was roughly calculated based on the BPAP health outcomes and economic literature. Using the Framingham model risk calculator and using the most conservative options for all parameters, changes in blood pressure will change the relative risk of MI by 2% within the 10-year time span. Of stroke, 2.5% of general cardiovascular disease, including angina, 5%. With our patient population of 232, this equates to 4.6 cases of MI, 5.8 cases of stroke, and 11 incidences of general CVD averted. From the literature, the total cost up to 36 months post-event for any of these occurrences can be found. Applying these costs to the number of cases averted, your total excess cost averted by the BPAP program at about 545,000 for MI and stroke alone. So in con conclusion, the center clearly adds value to the university, both in financial gains and more importantly in the community health mission of the university. My research demonstrates improved health outcomes in at least one program, substantial increases in community health capacity, and continuous financial growth in the years that the center has been in existence. There are several limitations to this work. As most public health studies, this is not a randomized control study, so there's no way of knowing whether the capacity growth would have occurred had the relationship between UR and the health department grown independently of the UR support and formalization. Similarly, if the center has not, had not transpired, would the health department have been able to perform these services? There's no way to know whether the university investment is the sole cause of the value increase in community health. Clearly, a concise measure of improved community health is needed to assess whether any public health system is effective. Although it is assumed that performance of the essential services will result in improved community health, this assumption has not been borne out in the literature, and essential public health functions are constantly changing. Typical of financial analysis, gains and losses go beyond the scope of this analysis. Opportunity costs are not accounted for, for example. If the university had invested 800000 in a different venture, would that value added have been greater? Also, there is difficulty with assessing a financial return on investment, given that the value returned may be to a different decision maker. You are invest, but the money saved in good health is advantageous to the patient, not necessarily the university. And also, because this model worked in Rochester does not mean it will work anywhere, although the model for value assessment can be duplicated and adapted. The university has a firm commitment to community benefit and has a unique relationship with local public health prior to their investment in the center. And lastly, a few key learning points. Assessing value in health must move beyond financial gains, since most public health entities work at break-even budgets. Measuring health outcomes and then assessing value to those outcomes is important. The qualitative assessment showed the importance of partnership in building a public health delivery system as delineated in the early IOM reports. Some system partners, such as academic medical centers, are well equipped to deliver public health essential services sometimes more efficiently. Most importantly, public health practitioners and researchers can move ahead with the information they have to construct a strong business case to advocate for the work they do. Demonstrating value is critically important during this time of decreased funding and difficult decision making. Thank you very much for your time, and I thank the uh, experts who have helped me with this work, and I welcome any comments or questions. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and before we actually go to the Q&A, we are also delighted to have with us our guest commentators for this afternoon who will be commenting on uh, Teresa's research. We have, first off, we have Dr. Michael Soto, who is a professor of health systems administration and population health at Georgetown University. Uh, Dr. Soto is also co-principal investigator of the CDC-funded linking assessment and measurement to PHEP systems, or the LAMP standard. He's also the director of the LAMP System Improvement Project, which seeks to adopt distance improvement practices for improving public health emergency preparedness. And we also followed, he'll be followed by Dr. Byron S. Kennedy, who's a director of the Monroe County Department of Public Health in Rochester, New York. And Dr. Kennedy is also board certified in preventive medicine 
and has broad expertise in community-based approaches aimed at improving the health of vulnerable patient populations. He'll also be providing a comment in terms of uh, what Theresa's research means for public health practice. So let's start off with uh, Dr. Stoto, and then he'll be followed by Dr. Kennedy. Well, uh, thank you very much, and um, thank you, Teresa, for an interesting talk, and thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, let me take a step back um, before, in making my comments in, in terms of the landscape that's been set up by the Affordable uh, Care Act. You know, most of the attention in the press is on things like the individual mandate and Medicaid expansion that are focused on coverage improvements. But in fact, there are a number of provisions uh, in the law that are aimed at improving population health. Let me mention just two important ones, I think. One is the uh, provision for accountable uh, care organizations and other value-based purchasing arrangements that hold health care providers accountable for outcomes rather than just paying for volume as in the current um, system. And the second one are the requirements uh, that nonprofit hospitals do community health needs assessments um, that are intended to steer the community benefits, which Teresa did mention, um, towards the activities uh, and, and the issues that um, communities actually uh, need. And these are on top of things like states that, including New York, have had in place for a, a while that, that do these kinds of uh, activities, They're really making them nationwide. Um, these, uh, the, um, the, these provisions in the Affordable Care Act uh, require that um, hospitals consult with public health in doing this, but oftentimes that's really uh, um, not done all that extensively. So the combination of these things and other uh, pop population health activity uh, initiatives in the, in the Affordable Care Act mean that smart health care delivery systems either have or soon will realize that they can't do it alone, that they really need public health departments as uh, important potential um, partners. And a good example of this is the uh, blood pressure uh, advocacy program example that uh, Teresa mentioned. Um, it's one um, of many activities for which that if the providers are held accountable for the cost of treating strokes and MIs, providers will need to seek help in going upstream uh, to uh, prevent these uh, in the first place. So with that as context, I think that the key question is not return on investment per se, but rather how communities, which I think of as hospitals and other providers, of course health departments and other organizations, as well as the residents themselves, how can these communities best work together to achieve population health goals? And, you know, no one ever asks, what's the ROI for the fire department or the police department? And they shouldn't do that for the health department, uh, in, in my view. And, and frankly, I'm personally skeptical that even uh, a, a well done uh, study about ROI really ha uh, can make that much influence on policymakers in this day and age of tight budgets. But it is relevant to ask whether any of these organizations are doing their job as effectively and as, as efficiently as, as, as possible. And I think that's where uh, the kind of analysis that we're talking about today can make a difference. Um, similarly, um, the healthcare providers who are now charged with being responsible for population health should be asking how best to achieve these, go these goals um, and whether or not, in particular, health partners can be, health departments can be effective partners in this effort. So from this perspective, I think that the example of the uh, University of Rochester Medical Center and particularly the Center for Community Health is a very interesting model um, to consider. Um, Yes, uh, Rochester has some uh, unique um, features, and not every community has an academic medical center, but more than a few do. And I think that the, the key interesting question I'd like to see is, what would it take to, uh, to replicate and adapt uh, the URMC approach uh, uh, in other communities? So that leads to a public health systems uh, and services research uh, activity. Um, but this uh, project uh, really requires uh, a qualitative, a primarily qualitative research design. Um, it should be designed um, to address questions such as why and how did this arrangement come into being? What are the main cont contextual variables that made it possible? How does it actually work uh, to improve population health? So in, in this um, case, um, studies about the uh, um, case studies like the blood pressure advocacy program and others that really take a look at um, the um, impact of these activities on population health are really uh, important. And this is an example where uh, quantitative measures are appropriate, 
um, but they really must reflect the nature of the collaboration. So as, as uh, in this example here, the, the focus is on uh, reducing uh, risk factors, um, knowing that strokes and MIs uh, will come along with that. Um, another question that needs to be uh, addressed is how can these collaborations be sustained? And here, I think, is where it's important to, to recognize the, the importance of uh, external funding uh, in academia. Um, the, the organizations, academic med medical centers, just need to pay, pay attention to that. And I think that the ROI calculations that Teresa um, mentioned are really important in, uh, for, the, for, su for sustaining these collaborations. Um, and then finally, um, I, the last question that needs to be addressed is how can policies encourage and enhance these co type of collaborations? Um, and specifically, whether how can the uh, CHNA requirements in the Affordable Care Act um, be, um, be, be written in a way that really um, encourages uh, health departments and medical centers uh, and others to, to really work together? Uh, it's interesting that uh, I mentioned New York State and uh, other states such as Massachusetts and North Carolina have had uh, these requirements in place for some time. And I think it would, would be a very interesting um, study to see how these uh, requirements actually make a difference in uh, collaboration. And then finally, I just want to make a methodological point that um, for this kind of research question, causality really isn't the issue. And uh, randomized clinical trials really aren't either are neither uh, appropriate nor necessary. What we really need is to borrow from the, uh, the quality improvement uh, literature that really thinks about how we can spread an innovation that has been shown to work in one place to other locations and how to adapt it as necessary uh, depending on, on, on the local context. And I think that's um, a, a kind of contribution that will come out of the, the qualitative uh, work that uh, Teresa has mentioned, um, but we didn't hear that much about uh, today. So at that point, I'm st I'll stop and I'll be happy to, to uh, take questions when the time comes. Thank you, uh, Michael. And uh, Byron, if you're online, you're, feel free to give your comments, please. OK. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that was a great, I guess maybe I'm setting and framing, I guess maybe I did already. And I've had actually working with her. It's been a great, I guess maybe a relationship you know, um, between um, the Department of Health as well as the Center for as well, um, even prior to her arrival. I think one of the things that's really uh, maybe key here is really the emphasis, you know, on the partnerships. And when you have, you know, partnerships, I mean, oftentimes, you know, that's, you know, that's more than just, you know, having a table where people come together, but really it's more about, you know, figuring out what are some of the common things, I guess, maybe that we are looking to achieve um, for the community and what are some of the unique assets that we bring to the table. So on the one hand, you know, as an agency, we have, if you will, maybe the maybe to ensure the health status of our jurisdiction, 750,000, and yet we realize that we don't necessarily have um, necessarily maybe all the tools in order to do that. And more importantly, I think in more recent, I guess maybe years, we realize that nor is that desirable. We really want to do this from a community perspective where we are leveraging against folks in the community, including our academic centers. So in this case, you know, some of the original guess, um, discussion, you know, was around some of the evaluation capacity, which oftentimes many local health departments, you know, may not necessarily have a lot of the staffing or the resources in order to conduct. You know, and then our, in our case here in Monroe County, perhaps have had maybe um, more than perhaps maybe some others, um, and probably less maybe than a few. Um, yet, you know, with diminishing budgets, which we have seen maybe nationwide, particularly in um, our um, community here, you still have the actual work that you need to get done. So by having this model where you can actually figure out um, what each brings to the table so you're not stepping over each other, but you're also respecting uh, the respective lanes that both the county, in this case the, the University of Rochester that they bring, and also to come up with a combined vision that has other players at the table, but us as being, uh, if you will, two leads with this particular effort that has been very, I guess, maybe impactful. And, and I, I know earlier, Dr. Stoda mentioned that, well, you don't really want to focus exclusively on the return of investment, and I 100% agree with that. On the other hand, wearing my agency hat, I know oftentimes I have to go before um, individuals who do, I guess, maybe give a lot of focus to that metric. And so whether that's with my um, county legislature or with my own county administration, I know oftentimes they may understand and may relate to the health outcomes that we're trying to uh, achieve, 
but at the end of the day, we have to think about you know um, some of our resources that we need to go along that pathway. So I think this work is actually really helpful in terms of actually establishing some of that literature in terms of um, the, the investment that you can see back with a modest, I guess maybe investment um, between, as you mentioned earlier, you know, um, more than a few communities have academic medical centers, and all of them have some type of um, local um, public health authority, um, whether that's county-based, municipal-based, or what have you. So I do think that that's we've been very um, great in terms of being fisheries of this partnership. But on the other hand, I think its success speaks to the fact that it was done in a very thoughtful way with a dialogue that included our two organizations. You know, about what could happen that was in the best interest of the community. That needs to be the starting point if you're talking about replicating this. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kenny, for your uh, comment and also Dr. Stoto. And we want to give uh, Teresa a chance to respond or also maybe um, also comment on those comments as well uh, before we open the floor to the questions, the Q&A. Teresa? Uh, sure, thank you. That was a great comments from both of you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we the relationships and how we move forward is extremely important. Um, also important is continuing funding so that the center keeps going. And with the academic medical centers under the same economic pressures as everybody else, it's becoming more and more important to show in tangible ways what benefit we are adding, whether that's in a financial return or in increased capacity. And that's gone a long way to keep our center funded. Um, in addition, the blood pressure advocacy program, my, my case study um, funding is, is important there as well. Uh, there was a big question this year as to whether or not to continue funding the program. And I used this information to say, yes, look, although it is an expensive program, look at the cost we're averting down the line. So no, no um, ROI is not the primary objective, but it certainly goes a long way in talking to for the BPAP program, these were business leaders who are funding the initiative. So showing business leaders that there is a financial return on investment was very important in continuing that funding. Um, I have the responsibility of running the community benefits um, uh, reporting for Monroe County. And Byron, from the health department, as well as the four other hospitals in the community, here in Rochester actually all work together on that initiative. And the hospitals, as they're giving money to the initiative, um, are asking, OK, where is my money best served? So the, the ACA, I agree with Dr. Stoto completely, the ACA is mandating that hospitals um, give more importance to community benefits. And that's coming in the form of financial dollars as well as resource um, support. But the financial dollars, they're wanting to see what the return is on that. So um, I think this work is, is going to be more and more necessary as we move forward. Mm. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Now we uh, open the floor to questions. You have uh, two options. You can either just uh, use the phone lines, or you can also uh, chat. Uh, type your questions in the chat box on the lower right. So the um, floor is open now for questions for Teresa. Hi, can you hear me? This is Sylvia Perani in the Office of Public Health Practice at the New York State Health Department. Well, hello. Hi, Teresa and colleagues. So thank you very much for this great presentation. I want to, again, underscore the importance of measuring the value of public health services delivered by public health agencies and their partners. While I agree with Dr. Stoto that, you know, why should we have to defend ourselves? Unfortunately, we have to defend ourselves all the time. So it's important to have this real data. And I also appreciate the attention to collaboration, something that we've been trying to promote in New York State with our prevention agenda and getting hospitals and local health departments to work together. And we certainly look to Monroe, which has been the model for that. I'm, I'm wondering, Teresa or others, whether you're thinking about measuring specific um, impacts of your efforts either tied to the priorities in the prevention agenda or to population groups, um, child health, or I know you're invested in working on obesity reduction, whether you thought about you know, 
priorities related to or efforts related to preventing chronic disease, those kinds of things? Um, sure. Well, the work that I've done in evaluating the center has um, basically come to a close, and I've given this information to the financial um, department here at the center, and they're sort of revamping the way they're looking at things moving forward to watch the growth of the center. But the study of impacts uh, related to value in investment is something I'm passionate about. So. The community benefits work, I think, is where this is taking hold, and that is definitely tied to the prevention agenda. So New York has a very robust prevention agenda that you can um, see by Googling New York Prevention Agenda 2013. Um, and at each goal in the prevention agenda is, is a robust list of measures as well as uh, evidence-based interventions, which is phenomenal. Um, in Monroe County, our community benefits have uh, set our goals for their needs assessment and improvement planning on the prevention agenda, and we're measuring improvement in those um, arenas moving forward. Um, one of the measures, though, now is going to be value added. So, for example, one of our interventions is um, working on smoking cessation, and all the hospitals in the Monroe County um, catchment area are uh, sending smokers who come to the hospital to the New York State quit line um, through the opt to quit program. So we're going to measure how many people have been referred to opt to quit, how many people stop smoking through opt to quit, what is the cost of somebody who stops smoking, the cost averted in, in disease down, downstream. Um, so calculating that as a measure of value and then reporting that back to the hospitals to say, you know, your small investment in community benefit led to this much cost averted just in the smoking goal from the prevention agenda, um, I think will be valuable. So um, I'm not taking this work to the prevention agenda, but certainly the community benefits work will have that impact. Great, thank you. I would, say that I would add that you know that you know I'm certainly maybe the the, the steps that were taken that Teresa already you know, that some you know, those would be that other things. Of course, you know, as was mentioned earlier, and sometimes types of this level of work always maybe does add maybe that. Okay, uh, we have a question I think from June who's asking Do all hospitals or just nonprofit hospitals fall under the ACA mandate as mentioned in this presentation? Well, um, certainly there's more experts on the line than me, but the the need to do a community health needs assessment and community health improvement plan are to maintain nonprofit status. So those would fall under the nonprofit hospitals. Um, other ACA mandates, um, you know, for improved population health kind of goes across the board. But the but the mandate to uh, provide better community benefits, shall we say, is a nonprofit hospital uh, requirement. Are there any more questions? Um. Phoebe, this is Kara. This is Kara. Um, I was just going to remind everybody to please uh, click the poll in the middle of the screen as to how they found out about the webinar. Just help us in the future. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Kara. This is Ann Kelly. Uh, Teresa, can you talk about what the next stages or future developments in this kind of research might be or the next project you'd like to do if you had the resources and the time? Well, for me, um, the next stages for this particular dissertation work is just in the dissemination, um, certainly writing uh, the project up and using Rochester as an example um, is one thing that we're working towards for literature, but also locally to take the information. And like I said, we presented this to the University of Rochester board to support continuing funding the center. Um, we also presented this information to the funders of our BPAP program, the Blood Pressure Advocate Program, um, to increase funding for the BPAP program, and both have been successful so far. Um, next steps as far as um, 
my work in assessing value, um, the, the uh, New York State Department of Health and myself are working, we just submitted a grant to, to measure value as uh, Dr. Stodo suggested, um, looking at community benefits. So, you know, yes, New York is one that has required community benefits reporting um, and community health improvement planning and needs assessment based on the prevention agenda for years. So we um, uh, put together an application to, to measure that as, as Dr. Soto suggested is how has that changed policy, how has that policy changed relationships and changed value added over the years and how have hospitals reported community benefits, has that changed over the years that we've been requiring um, links to the prevention agenda, links to evidence-based medicine, and and um, you know what value has that added over time? So that's that's my next uh, step in this work. And you know I did I did present this to the APHA and and to other practitioners who talk about you know how do we measure value? I think it's the big take-home message is you know it's not as complicated as it seems, and I think people get very afraid when they have to present financial stuff or have to present, um, you know, yeah, the jumping into financial world and economic world is a little bit scary, but if you just take it step by step and present something because, um, as has been said many times, people who are making policy are very interested in that, you know, show me what difference you're making, how, how if I invest dollars in you, what am I going to get in my return? And I think uh, public health practitioners and researchers need to just jump in and, and, and start looking at this and not be afraid of the big picture so much. So can I, can I this is Mike Stoddard again. I, I want to say something about that, that last point. I mean, I, I understand that people are always being asked to say, to justify public health activities in terms of ROI because that's a, it's a convenient thing. But it seems to me that the, um, the best answer um, would be to say, here's what we can do uh, in terms of improving um, health outcomes, and the hospitals need us, um, and to make that case, um, and get the hospitals to help make that case uh, for them. I mean, it seems to me, ultimately, that's a, both a more, more honest and a more productive um, um, a, a, a f effort to, uh, to really justify um, the impact of, uh, of health departments. Yeah, and I think at Keeneland, um, during the policy panel, they had mentioned that, that everybody can kind of make an ROI case for anything. Um, so I think we at least need to be at the table on that, but also to go beyond and talk about value added. And Thank you. Good. Okay, and go ahead, Matt. On our side, too. Yeah. Good point, good point. Um, I guess uh, you, you could get in touch uh, with Teresa directly, Matt, with your question about, you know, how to recover the university's uh, $0.8 million contribution through indirect cost recovery. Um, did you include a ratio like that in your analysis, uh, Teresa, by just any chance we'll take this last question? Yeah, I, um, it was in the slides on indirect costs, um, not as a percent of the $8 million that they give us, but um, indirect costs over time from fiscal year to fiscal 12. Um, I'm not sure what slide number it is, but the title is indirect costs and showing that the um, we're recovering uh, about 50% um, indirect costs out of supported funds right now. So it's the bottom line of that indirect cost graph. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Teresa, for the wonderful presentation. And we'd also like to thank our guest commentators, Dr. Soto and Dr. Kennedy, for your comments too as well. We'd like to thank everyone also for uh, joining us in this webinar today. We also just want to remind you that uh, next, uh, I guess in August 27th, our next uh, webinar, and this will be a presentation by Dr. Kaja Abbas from Virginia Tech, who will be presenting his research in priorities in rural health, cost-effectiveness analysis of fungal meningitis outbreak in the New River Health District. So please uh, keep that in your calendars, uh, just to remind you. And Anne, do you have anything else would you like to add? Um, no, I'll just, uh, we'll be sending out announcements for the August 27th webinar, and then we'll have them scheduled about every two weeks uh, for the remainder of the year. So uh, we'll send out lots of announcements and calendar appointments, and there is included in the announcements the upcoming presentation. So all of this series of 10 presentations are 
the uh, pre and postdoctoral researchers grant that were completed last year in public health services and systems reports. So more to come, and thanks for your attendance today. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.